Hello, welcome to the Lenart Medi Conference Talks, a series uh, put on by the Lenart Medi Conference uh, of discussions on uh, issues in foreign policy, security policy, uh, politics, uh, democracy. Uh, today, my guest will be Ann Applebaum, uh, who many of you know is the author of uh, important histo historical works on the Gulag, and, uh, the takeover of Eastern Europe uh, by Soviet communists, uh, her book on the Ukraine, and most recently, her book, The Twilight of Democracy, which is not a book of history, but rather a book on the state of democracy today. And I should also say that uh, for me, Anne is a true MAGA because she has made the Atlantic great again. And I'm, uh, as a longtime Atlantic reader, uh, with, when Anne came over there, it became even better than it was before. So welcome, Anne. Uh, you have been to Estonia. We have had lots of fun here in the past. Um, but today, let's talk about your book, uh, The Twilight of Democracy. Um, and I'd start off this way, is that, I mean, we have this problem, of this, this massive rise of populism, populist nationalism, uh, and that's, <clears throat> that was also the focus of um, my talk with Frank Fukuyama, where uh, uh, his recent book on identity actually looks at the psychological basis of why people are attracted to this kind of ideology. Now, your book is much more, I would say, I mean, my impression at least, is kind of in the, uh, in the sort of a follow-up uh, 70 years later to Czesław Miłosz's The Captive Mind, which doesn't look at why people are attracted to these things, but uh, rather why it is that uh, people who otherwise and before would be considered kind of normal so become very cynical and are attracted to uh, or begin to spout and go along with ideologies that you would think given their past they would be smart enough and uh, honest enough not to follow. And, uh, and it's, it's looking really at the people behind perhaps the, the, uh, the Orbans and the Kaczynskis, but who are the ones who are doing the, as it were, dirty work for them. I was wondering if you could sort of talk about why you, I realized that from you start off in your book with uh, with how the, you, these people, all of you people, were together at one time 20 years ago and now have gone apart, very wide apart. What do you think of... So, yes, thank you for the, for the question. Thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry that I'm not in Estonia. You're right, I have been there a couple of times and I think saw you probably on both trips um, and... and um, you know, wish we could all be together today and maybe someday again we will. Um, so yes, you're right. The book is, first of all, very different from my previous history books, um, um, some of which have been published in Estonian. Um, it, is not a, it is not a product of years of archival work and it is not an attempt to project, you know, to present an objective picture of a, of a complicated piece of history. Um, it is subjective. It's told from my point of view. Uh, I talk about people that I know um, and it's also, while saying what it's not, I should say that you're right, it's not a book about why people vote for populists or why people like nationalism. I mean, there's probably a little hint of it in there, um, but that isn't what, that isn't the main topic. The topic is, as you say, the, the elites, the intellectuals, the journalists, the political strategists, um, the, sometimes in some cases the propagandists, the people who create the mythology and the and the language of nationalism and of and of modern authoritarian populism. Um, why did I write about this particular group of people? One, because they're very important and often overlooked. People, of course, write about populist leaders, and of course, they try, I think, often unsuccessfully, actually, to explain why people vote for them. But they very rarely focus on this 
um, very important layer of people who are the ones who create the campaigns and who create the movements. Um, you know, on which populist leaders ride to power. That's one reason I wrote about them. The second reason I wrote about them is because I know some of them. Um, and I know them because 20 and 30 years ago, they were, as you say, part of, some of them anyway, were part of the anti-communist or in some case, Reaganite right, um, which, you know, which is where I encountered them in the, in the 1980s in some cases or the 1990s or early 2000s. Um, and at that time, um, most of them were part of the wave of liberalization and the wave of democratization and the wave of, you know, free, you know, free markets that, that washed over not just Central Europe, but all of Europe um, in that era. And they were great enthusiasts for, for that wave. And some of them were important members of, as I say, of, of the anti-communist or pro-market or pro-democracy forces in their various countries. And so the question is, and that's why I know them because I was part of that same movement too, as a as a as a as a young journalist and 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 writer. Um, so the the question that I began with was, why have some of them gone in a different direction? Um, and I do talk about, as you say, I talk about a few very specific people, some some whom I know, one or two of whom I know pretty well, some of whom I I know just from. Um, from their public activities, um, but I often, it's, it's often the case that I know people who know them, and I try and explain it. And as as you'll note, there isn't there isn't a single answer. There isn't a this is not a political science textbook, and I'm not trying to prove a case. And there isn't a one explanation for why why this group this small group of people made the choices that they did. Um, the one thing I would say that probably unites them is a sense of disappointment. So they are disappointed with, with their society as they, are, as they are. Some cases they're disappointed with their own role in those societies or they were resentful of, of, how, they, um, of how they ended up after, after 20 years of, of post-communist, of, 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 of democracy. And and you know, the, and that disappointment and that resentment is the beginning of their, of their, of their sort of intellectual and personal journeys. Well, yeah, across the board, and I would say also here in this country as well, where where we also have a very strong uh, populist movement, uh, which is in some ways even more extreme than uh, the, the cases you bring in terms of homophobia and racism, that they're kind of like the second, second tier, like the, uh, they weren't the ones who actually did the hard work when it needed to be done, but rather people who enjoying the fruits of, of uh, independence, of democratization, uh, now see a niche in which they can advance their own political careers, appealing to sort of appealing to emotions, appealing to uh, a sense of uh, the the people who didn't make out as well from the uh, from the transition from a from a authoritarian totalitarian governments, but who also in many ways lack the intellectual basis to actually do anything. Now, some of them, of course, the ones in your book, there are quite important people, but you, they seem to be more the source. I mean, Robert Scruton, who actually is, um, I think, very interesting philosopher, of course, I think would probably also be disgusted by the kinds of things that his, his idea of <laughs> old England or little England uh, have been turned into, I'd say, in the UK, but analogous versions of some kind of halcyon Polish or Hungarian past that really, if you know Polish or, or uh, Hungarian history, or if you know Estonian history, where we have the same thing, it never really existed at all, but it's now kind of being built up as some kind of pastoral idol, even though in our case, we were tenant farmers on our land. So, but still, I mean, the 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 nastiness is one of the things that really surprises me in all of this. I mean, it's there was a veneer of, or I don't know if it was a veneer, but there was at least an understanding on my part that we had 
I mean, we had we had become normal. You know, we had become what we. I mean, the whole line. We if we're, had were it not for Soviet occupation and communism, we would be just like Western Europe. But now we see that we're not so much, and at least uh, the 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 part of Europe not occupied by the Soviet Union. It too has its nasty populace and its nationalists, and you have, you know, AfD in Germany, and um, I mean, you have analogous parties elsewhere, but they're they're not in power, <laughs> and they don't seem to have a great chance of being there. Whereas here we are, and what then what that leads to, which has been one of my bet mars for years, is the um, uh, this, um, I would say, the last form of racism that's allowed, which is being racist uh, toward East Europeans, of which I think the recent film Borat is another example, which you can make fun of East Europeans, or I mean, Walter Frank Steinmeier, after one thing in one country being kind of nasty, I think it was Hungary, Poland, one of those two, suddenly says like, well, all of Eastern Europe has serious problems, and you go, wait a minute. Of course, now it's been extended to my own country. But nonetheless, the point is that we're back to looking upon Eastern Europeans as second rate, second order, not really quite civilized people, which really irks me. Yes. So the, the kinds of movements that I describe in my book are very much an, um, not East European. So. Um, and in the book is constructed that I talk about Poland and Hungary, but I also talk about Spain and I talk about the UK and I talk about the United States. Um, and one of the reasons why I did that range of countries was that I wanted to show that these are sentiments and moods and attitudes that you can find in any modern democracy. And it's just a question of whether at any given moment, um, how, you know, what kind of majority they have and how, how the politics works. Um, I mean, I think it is perfectly plausible to imagine a French election in which Marine Le Pen or, or some other national front, or uh, it's called something else now, the, 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 the rally, you know, the, or, or, some, or some other far right leader wins. I can, I can, I can imagine that. Um, I can imagine a Spanish government in which the Vox party, the far right party, have, plays a role. Um, you know, the AFD did extremely well in, in last election. So these, these parties, their fortunes rise and fall, but they are, um, they are a manifestation of something that I think is, um, you know, um, kind of inherent in any society which is modernizing quickly. And goodness knows Eastern Europe, Central Europe have modernized very quickly in the last 20 and 30 years. Um, and that is that when, when you have this very high pace of change, um, you get a portion of the population who become, first of all, who, are, who, are, who, who do not benefit from the change or perceive themselves as not benefiting, because in the case of many of these countries, everybody has benefited, if you look at it um, statistically. Um, but, but they perceive themselves as not benefiting, or they have some nostalgia for things that were lost. And things are lost in modernization. You know, we do move along. We do leave behind ways of life. Um, um, and the, the philosopher who you mentioned, Roger Scruton, um, you know, who, is, who, as you say, is not one of these, he not, was not part of any far-right movements at all, but he was someone who expressed that kind of nostalgia for the past very well. That was what his writing was so brilliant at doing. Um, and so there is a nostalgia, there is something that's lost. And, you know, in, in, in successful modernizing societies, um, you know, political leaders find ways of of overcoming that, and in less successful, you know, and then in in, in others they don't. The, the main point is that you know these are this this mood and this anger has been part of every society that's modernized quickly, whether it was 19th century Germany or 19th century France, and you know we all need to learn to live with it. I mean, I am very very against the idea that this is some kind of East European phenomenon. I I do agree that having a Polish government that almost seems to want to play some kind of you know, role of, you know, stereotype of, you know, resentful, angry, anti-German, anti-European, um, you know, the, you know their, their, their foreign policy has put them, has kind of made, them, has pushed them aside and made them be, and made them, they've been sort of dismissed by the rest of Europe because they seem to be playing out some kind of stereotype. 
Um, I mean, that's that's unfortunate, but I but I still maintain that this this kind of political party can do well anywhere. I mean, including as we as we know in the United States. I mean, I would absolutely classify the American Republican Party as being this kind of political party and representing the same kind of politics. And if it can happen in the United States of America, which is the world's, by depending on how you count, certainly one of either the world's oldest democracy or one of the world's oldest democracies, um, then it can happen anywhere. Well, one of the things that strikes me is that almost all of them, virtually all of these parties talk about the uh, the people left behind by you know, the change, uh, be it in the U.S., uh, it was manifested as sort of the, glo- or the effects of globalism and uh, certainly in Eastern Europe as uh, uh, one of the prices that we had to pay for not being in communism. But you know, just at a, as a point of interest, I l- looked at the, uh, the U.S. Le- falls out of this, but I looked at the Gini coefficients, that is the measure of economic inequality in, uh, in these countries. And there is no difference really if you take, the, I mean, generally between the, 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 in the countries of the East and the countries of the West. And in fact, Hungary long before uh, Orban came rolling back was actually one of the lowest Gini coefficients in Europe. And so it's certainly they're not the preterite, you know. I mean, this is not a case where you have this, with this, uh, it is not like Silicon Valley where you have uh, everyone who has a home is a billionaire and, uh, and all the service staff is living in trailers uh, along parked along the side of the uh, Camino Real, and they go home to their wherever they live because they couldn't afford a place to live near Palo Alto. I mean, yes, it, there is a problem of grotesque income inequality in the United States, which has also been exacerbated, I think, by Donald Trump's tax policies, which <laughs> make the rich even richer, um, and by and the IRS, which says it doesn't have the time to do audits of rich people. We only audit poor people, which is kind of a s- strange approach to take. Nonetheless, I mean, there is a, there is a fallacy underlying this, as if that uh, you know we support those people who have suffered under under uh, uh, the transformation. Yet, actually. They're all doing rather well, and I'm sort of deeply annoyed by this, you know, this line. This, this is a re- another really important myth to, to blow down, um, that this, the sole source of these populist, authoritarian populist movements is either inequality or, or economics. Um, certainly, I mean, if you, if you just look at Poland, you know, Poland is a country where um, everybody is wealthier than they were a generation ago. Um, and where inequality has actually been shrinking in the last several years, um, it certainly was under the under the previous government. Um, uh, you know, it's also the case that the people whom I write about, the um, you know, the, as again, the, the 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 journalists, the political strategists, the people who work on behalf of the populists, are all universally well educated, universally English speaking. Um, or foreign language speaking, universally well traveled. Um, these are all people who are, um, you know, who are integrated with the world. They are not some, you know, they are not poor and downtrodden. Um, and it's also very often the case that the very poorest people, um, in you know, don't vote for populists. I mean, certainly in the United States, um, the very poorest did not vote for Donald Trump. And so, therefore, you need some better explanation <laughs> for these things than than a than a simple. Um, kind of Marxist economic one, you know, that it's all, it's some kind of working class revolution. No, this is a revolution or a, or a movement anyway, um, of people who, uh, you know, as I said at the beginning, are disappointed and resentful. And that can be for many reasons. That can be for, because they don't like the way that their societies turned out. It can be because they personally aren't as successful as they thought they should be. They felt they should be, um, uh, they felt they should be you know, prime minister by now, and instead they're only, you know, deputy assistant secretary of state, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's people who are, who are disappointed with their own status or, or their own role. Uh, And that, and that is not necessarily a reflection of pure economics. Um, And so, no, I don't think that you can explain 
European, certainly you can't explain European and American authoritarian populism by a, a simple economic measure. Yeah, I'm actually drawn more and more to, uh, uh, to Nietzsche's uh, genealogy of morals, where he uses the word resentiment from French, where he says that, says we don't have this word in German, <laughs> I'll use the French word. But when it's, it's much stronger than resentment, because it's resentment combined with hatred of the ones you resent. I mean, it becomes a, he calls it slave morality in there. But I mean, what you see is like real hatred of those that you feel resentful toward in, uh, which I find actually very Bolshevik, ultimately. I mean, I find a lot of the... I mean, it, for Absolutely. me, that, it, I, I tie that to Bolshevism, actually. Yes, I mean, my, I actually wrote an article um, on in, it was in 2017, on the anniversary of the, of the Bolshevik Revolution, comparing Bolshevik language to the language of modern populism. And of course, I got a lot of pushback, especially from the populists who think of all think of themselves as having been anti-communist or, or anti-left. But actually, it is very much the case that the kind of language they use is about replacing elites. It's about upending the system. And as you say, the, the sentiment has, it's this resentment plus hatred, and which, you know, which if you think about it, is always the beginning of radicalism. Because where does, where does extremism and radicalism, where do they come from? They come from the sense that, you know, of total despair. Your society is, is a catastrophe. Nothing can be done. There's no point in reform. Democracy is a failure. Politics are a waste of time. What we need is you know, we need something completely different and we need to smash everything up. And this sentiment is extremely Bolshevik. <laughs> um, and it is, it is the way that, um, that modern authoritarian populists often speak. Um, those who've come to power have also used absolutely recognizable Bolshevik tactics in order to rule. In other words, they've created political parties. You know, they've set up the, in effect, one party states in which their other parties are are allowed to exist legally, but are essentially pushed aside, deprived of money, deprived of access. Um, the playing field is tilted so that only one party can possibly win. Um, and this is done through control of the media or um, as well as control of the courts and other institutions. Um, and the party is the thing that decides who gets promoted. So in other words, in the bureaucracy, in the civil service, people aren't given jobs according to how clever they are or how good they are at science. They're giving jobs according to how loyal they are to the party and to its ideology. And this is absolutely Bolshevik. <laughs> and this is how this is how communism, you know, Soviet-style communism worked um, in the Soviet Union and in Central Europe, and of course in the Baltic states, as as you'll you all remember. Um, very well. And this, this way of thinking, you know, that, that, that politics is about power and control and keeping everything within the party, um, you know, and it's not about debate and competition. Um, there's no element of meritocracy. There's no element of, um, uh, you, know, you know, people being able to move up the ladder who, have, who are apolitical or who have different kinds of talents. I mean, this is, this is the essence of modern authoritarian populism, and this is, this is exactly why it resembles Bolshevism of the past. Well, one step that already has been taken uh, in two countries, and I see an attempt in the United States, is to actually do away with one of the underpinnings of liberal democracy, which is the uh, Montesquieu and division of powers, and taking control of the courts. Uh, which we see uh, real major attacks on the court system in, in Poland and its dismantlement. Uh, and now we actually see this in the United States. Uh, not all, I'm not even talking about the uh, Amy Coney Barrett nomination, which is full of all kinds of hypocrisy, but the, I mean, a very conscious attempt on the part of the Republican Party to basically nominate only Republicans to uh, all federal courtship, uh, court positions. Um, and I see that's the next worry. And then after that, um, I mean, then you start getting to political repression and criminal convictions. And I know in Poland, you just had a, a one of the first cases, I guess, of 
of someone arrested for their political behavior, not even you know demonstrating, but just for being opposed to the government. Perhaps you can talk about that too. Yes. So obviously, control of the courts and manipulation of the courts has been um, a problem in Hungary. It's a major issue in Poland. I mean, it's it, the United States is a little bit different, but yes, it's true that the um, Republican Party manipulated the system so that it could um, appoint, uh, again, loyal Republicans, very often people who are only borderline qualified uh, to be judges, which is, which is very similar to what's happened in Poland. Um, and of course, once you, have con- once you have politicized courts and you have courts that are somehow loyal to the ruling party, um, then that gives you license to do all kinds of other things. Um, and in Poland, we've actually, there have actually been a couple of cases. I mean, there's three that I know of. Um, one more recent, very more spectacular one in which people have been arrested on so-called corruption charges, um, where where it looks like in practice the cases fall, the corruption case falls apart very quickly, um, and the real reason for the arrest is political. And the most recent one was a very prominent lawyer, um, who's a he's a he's a he's a, a, f- a friend of ours. He's actually my husband's lawyer. Um, and and the lawyer of Donald Tusk and and, and other prominent opposition figures. And he's somebody who brought a couple of corruption cases against the ruling party leader, Kaczynski. So he's, so he's, who particularly dislikes him. Um, And there was was a case brought against him that, you know, I I, I can't, I mean, the details are complicated, but it is already, it was a a few days ago, and it's already falling apart, so much so that a, uh, a Polish court, which was meant to kind of rubber stamp it and say, after the prosecution brought the case and and put everybody in jail, has refused to do so because the case is so weak. Um, so the, you know, nevertheless, people were put in handcuffs and, you know, and so on. But, but the, you know, the, you know, the, 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 mis- the abuse of the prosecution service, the abuse of the security services, which were used to gather information, um, and the abuse of the courts is is leading right down this alley. I mean, that's why you know that's why it's done. I mean, that's what I mean. There, I mean, of course, there are other reasons to control the courts. Um, in 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 a number of countries, the courts play a role in certifying elections. Um, the courts can also play a role in gerrymandering. Um, um, in the U.S., the courts play a role in issues to do with, for example, dark money and and money in politics. Um, and the Republican courts have been rubber stamp or have been allowing, um, have, you know, have made a series of decisions that have made, you know, have, have really corrupted U.S. politics to a degree that would have been unthinkable even a generation ago. Um, and so the, the, you know, these kinds of, uh, you know, um, the, 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 you know, the, the control of the courts is one of the, is one of the elements that a, you know, an anti-democratic ruling party can use in order to make sure that it can stay in power. I mean, what we're really talking about here are political parties who come to power, often democratically, who once in power, change the rules. Um, And of course, there's always been a temptation to do this, you know, because in a way, you know, democracy requires you to do this very difficult thing, which is to win power, and then to say, okay, but I'm going to preserve the system so that four years from now or five years from now, my political enemies can contest me again and might take my power away. And therefore you have to leave the, you have to leave uh, the media open. You have to make sure the courts are neutral. You have to keep the civil service neutral. You have to make sure that there is this possibility for political competition again. And it's always been tempting to end that. Um, and, you know, it, and in a number of countries, there are laws that, that preserve that, the, those neutralities. Um, but quite a lot of it is also preserved by norms and by a sense that there's a sort of fair way to do politics in an unfair way. Um, and once the norms begin to break down, um, this is when democracy becomes harder and harder to maintain. Well, I mean, let's always recall that uh, uh, it was um, Adolf Hitler needed Franz von Papen uh, to form a government. And he was, uh, I mean, I guess, a predis- I mean, sort of the what is now the CDU. Uh, I mean, he was a conservative and he formed this coalition. And then that was only after coming to power through completely parliamentary procedures, he formed a government and then started acting. And this is, this is, uh, so you can, um, we just have to keep that in mind that uh, you don't need a coup and uh, in order to to uh, come into power and then usurp it. 
Um, there's one more element which um, which is not in your book, and it's it's it's. I mean, we don't see it. We we're only beginning to see it, but it's the politicization of the civil service. I mean, the Westminster system of okay, you have you have your ministers, and he has some advisors, or she has some advisors, but then basically you have a, a neutral civil service. Now, just just the, in the past week uh, from this recording, uh, Donald Trump wants to actually really, really uh, completely overturn this in the U.S. government. Um, and we see the same thing happening with um, uh, in a number of countries uh, today. And it actually that's where when you when you give up uh, when you give up on having a professional civil service, uh, then you see the problems that you often see already today in the U.S. with uh, with the uh, politicized ambassadors who are, I mean, some of them like Sondland, I mean, one of the most incompetent persons ever, Grinnell, who was the uh, US ambassador to Germany, I mean, had no clue on how to behave and basically he sort of it was a one man destruction battalion on, uh, on relations with Germany. But we see this across the board. And so, I mean, these elements of uh, the courts, the civil service, I mean, they all kind of lead to a slow erosion of democracy. Um, and what worries me the most is that we're not really paying attention enough. Your book pays it, is someone who sort of draws attention to this. But we're not, and, and oddly enough, one of the other great people to write about uh, these things is another historian of Eastern Europe, Timothy Snyder, which is a whole different reason why two people who are, who are historians of Eastern Europe are the ones who are most concerned about how, how democracy is faring. But I guess this makes kind of perfect sense. But any, in any case, I mean, your book and I were rather pessimistic. I mean, how do you, like, maybe we can sort of uh, end, uh, end this talk on how you see, what's the way out? I mean, we have these problems, courts, civil service, uh, cynical people operating the media. How do we get out of this mess and how do we sort of restore the uh, optimism of, say, you know, the, the, the first half of the or the, the, the 90s when we actually were celebrating the triumph of liberal democracy over authoritarian systems? So I have, um, you know, made a decision. I mean, it, uh, come to a conclusion rather that um, it is irresponsible to be pessimistic. Um, I am a natural pessimist. Uh, one of the reasons I've spent so much of my life writing about difficult, hard, sad issues is because I'm drawn to them. I, 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 I'm constantly drawn to the darker side of human nature and wanting to explain it and understand it. Um, but for the sake of our, you know, our children um, and their children, it is simply wrong to be pessimistic about democracy. You know, for someone, uh, you know, of, of my, you know, our generation to say, we, you know, it's all terrible and it can't be fixed is to leave them with nothing, you know, with no, with no future. Um, and I simply won't do that. Um, and even, even, the, even, even whatever the worst outcomes are, um, I will always argue that there's something to fight for. Um, and I, but I think, I mean, there are a number of ways to answer the question of what we should do. I mean, there, there, is a, there is a problem in all modern democracies about civic engagement. You know, politics really did become over the last couple of decades something that people, you know, for experts, you know, people somewhere over there, you know, in Washington or Brussels or, you know, Tallinn, they do politics and we don't have to worry about it. We just show up to vote every few years. Um, and I think that was a mistake that we allowed that to happen. Um, you know, finding a way to revitalize civic life, um, political parties, making them something real to people again. It may be that we need new political parties in a number of countries. Um, and finding ways to engage people and have people understand that politics is something that affects them and that their participation can also have an effect. In other words, making people feel more represented. I mean, there may be, um, I'm part of a group that spends a lot of time talking about the ways in which we could reform voting systems and there are technical ways you could change democracy to make it feel more fair and make it less divisive, ranked choice voting, other, other things like that. Um, 
And then there's some really big things that I think democracies could do together. Um, one of them is to figure out a way to regulate the internet, um, by which I don't mean censoring social media. I mean, uh, I mean, democracies thinking about how do we, you know, we know what a Chinese internet looks like. We know what an autocratic internet looks like. Um, what does a democratic internet look like? How can it be more transparent? How can we, um, how, how do we limit anonymity? How do we make sure that the algorithms are pushing rational conversation and not division? How do, you know, maybe we need an ombudsman for algorithms. You know, these are, if these are going to be the platforms upon which our political conversation is going to take place, then we need some control of them. And then the, 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 the other big conversation is to be had about dirty money, corruption, kleptocracy. Um, all of our countries have been malformed, um, and I believe the politics have been deformed as well. Um, by these big flows of 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 you know illicit money that that travel around the world, and as a, as democracies, we need to jointly find a way um, of stopping that. So I, I think there are both there are both local and national and international solutions um, to you know to this problem. You know if we can just you know if we can if we can get if we can come to a consensus that we all need to work on them together. We are never going to leave the internet era. I mean, there'll be something new someday. We can't imagine it yet, but this is not going away. Uh, this is like my part of my spiel when I say, look folks, you have to digitize your governance too to become competitive and, and modern. But I mean, the point is that this is not going away and we have to really approach this with with far more intelligence than we have. And when I hear people saying, well, the Sherman, well, whatever, I mean, in, in the US, the Sherman Antitrust Act does not really apply to the, inter, to the uh, internet. I go, yeah, well, there weren't any railroads or oil companies either, and so you made up new legislation. It's not you're gonna take 100-year legislation and apply it to these companies. Be creative, think. Uh, uh, and indeed, the uh, the role of um, I mean the the dis sort of destruction of the kind of editorial function of mass media when it was limited in number and you had quality newspapers that had resp that had responsible editors and then you had trash. Now that's I mean, it, there are no distinctions, and and then you have all of the fake newspapers, right? I mean, so. So we have to really work hard on that end. Um, I agree on ranked choice voting, but that's really a, that's an Anglo problem. I mean, you have these distortions of democracy, which I think are exacerbated by the internet when you have first past the post election system. And first past the, one of the things that saved a lot of Europe, I think, is actually having a parliamentary system. Uh, in fact, the US, it's probably the only country that's managed to have a presidential system without turning into a dictatorship. I mean, everyone else has, and it's, and you even see the, I mean, all of the so-called new countries in the EU also all have parliamentary systems. And in fact, uh, Ukraine and uh, Georgia went over to parliamentary systems because they realized we better do that because otherwise we're gonna have problems. We have to think much more creatively and not just protest against the bad behavior of, uh, of these mm, populist, nationalist, you know, uh, sort of crypto authoritarian systems, but actually come up with solutions. And so I agree, we need not only civic engagement, we need thinking about how we get out of this. So I'm not a pessimist either. I agree with that, absolutely. Let me just ask you, how is, uh, what, what, what languages is your book being translated into? So you're asking, I, I should have checked before coming on. I, I know, um, I know it's up to 10 or 11. Um, I know that we, I know that Dutch, Danish, Slovak, I believe are already out. Um, I know that German, French, Spanish, Italian are coming. Um, and I'm afraid I don't know whether there's an Estonian edition. Well, I, I, to, I mean, I the problem out, we I have so. is that the people who would be interested in this already read it in English. So it's like, so, right. but, uh, no, but I do think the it's the same a, problem in a lot. Of yeah, I yeah. recommend everyone uh, read Anne's uh, Twilight of Democracy. Uh, uh, we, uh, 
In Eastern Europe, I think we, uh, we ha all know you extremely well for your books. And, and of course, if you, I would also say, if you want to follow US politics, then definitely read Anne's articles in The Atlantic. So thank you, and uh, give my regards to Roddick from me. And uh, eventually, I hope to see you again. And your tree is doing wonderfully on my farm. So thank you very much. Thank you. We planted a tree when we were there. Thank you very much. I enjoyed speaking to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.